Hi guys, welcome to Counterpoints. My name is Connor, and today we're going to be breaking down Exodite, Episode 1, Flame. At Games Workshop's request, we are working through our back catalog to make content more transformative, so we're not just showing off 100% of their product during our breakdowns. I will be pausing intermittently to break down lore and observations, so if you want to watch the original in its entirety, please go to Warhammer TV, and if you're in a non-service country, use a VPN. This episode is brought to you by Mastermind Models and Miniatures and Libra Demonica. Mastermind Models and Minis is an insanely talented paint studio out of Huntsville, Alabama, who do commissions domestically and internationally. So if your pile of shame is weighing you down, be sure to check them out in the description below and be sure to tell them that we sent you. Libra Demonica is an incredible Estonian-based third-party bits manufacturer who will absolutely take your models to the next level. Be sure to check them out as well. The lessons of the past are forever lost to the present. Even those learned in the wake of tragedy are easily forgotten. of upstart empires and their naive ambition have ever bound us to a cycle of war and loss. If only they would learn from our mistakes. It took the near destruction of our race for us to learn the foremost of truths. of existence is that the only path to understanding is to suffer. This is, as it has always been, a galaxy of the ignorant and the deluded, of lost children comforted only by the illusions they create for themselves. Setting up our action, we are greeted by the monologue of an Eldari Exodite, the titular background of our story. The Eldar, once the preeminent power in the galaxy, became prideful in their superiority. They mastered space travel on great colony ships, seeded life throughout the galaxy, flitted from planet to planet via an interdimensional tunnel system known as the Webway, and created technological, martial, and psychic marvels. Effectively immortal, they grew bored with their own power and thus dedicated their days to Colosseum slaughters, blood rituals, and orgies. A few Eldar souls despised this dark path and fled on massive ships known as craft worlds. Others terraformed and colonized faraway planets known as maiden worlds. When the excesses of the Eldar birthed the dark god of Slanesh, 90% of their population was instantly killed, and the only Eldar left standing were those nestled in the webway, sailing on craft worlds, or on humble colonies on maiden worlds. Those that made these terraformed worlds their homes became known as Exodites, those who had left on an exodus from the rest of their society to attune their relationship with nature. They hide from the rest of the galaxy's races, knowing that if their planets are found, they will be butchered and colonized. In our current story, this has already happened, with the fledgling town race setting up a colony on the planet, which is now being savaged by the Imperium of Man. All that you do is for the greater good. I give to you this lesson, Lakoma. Fire does not always render Earth to ash. In the heat of its passing, new pathways can be opened. You must burn as a fire stoked by purpose. Where once you followed, you will lead. You are now Shastre, a torch held in the hand of the greater good. The flame of which shall purify and renew all that seems lost. Progress is forged in such ways. I understand, honored one. Go now and be the fire. The greater good.
units of the greater good maintain your strength and that of your battle suit Shastre. The Exodite narrator perhaps most tellingly states that suffering is the only path to understanding and that this is a galaxy of lost children comforted by the illusions they create, which immediately transitions into an ethereal telling a Tau fire warrior that all you do is for the greater good and that fire does not just render all into ash, but also creates new paths, which is the nature of progress. This metaphor for destruction is the exact kind of illusion the Eldar Exodite is disgusted with because it is the high-minded idealism that drives the Tau Empire. So common in the 40k setting are warlike races that set upon each other, but perhaps unique to the Tau, they overcame their bloodthirsty nature. Once a culture of warring Stone Age savages and medieval fiefdoms, Tau prophets known as Ethereals unified their people through a calming and unknown aura that drew in all to serve what has been called the greater good. This philosophy provides guidance and purpose to the Tau people, assigning each of them a cast at birth. Earth cast are technicians and builders. Fire cast are warriors. Air cast are pilots and explorers. And water cast are diplomats, administrators, and merchants. It is the purpose of each Tau to fulfill their family's cast to their maximum ability and contribute to their race's greatness. Unlike many other factions in Warhammer 40k, the Tau are not xenocidal. They incorporate mercenary warriors like the Krut, Vespids, and even human Guevesa into their ranks and societies. This is met with predictable ferocity from the Imperial of Man, who view the Tau as an upstart race, barely of note except for their high technology and resistance to Imperial efforts. The Tau actually value each member of their society and try to minimize casualties whenever possible. They arm even their line warriors with armor, integrated communications, artificial intelligence drones, and powerful weapons. Battlesuits are iconic and value technology in Tau society, providing high mobility, blistering firepower, and even advanced technologies like railguns and cloaking. Shasrae Lacoma receives a briefing stating that the Tau are attempting to treat with the Imperium Man, but an Eldar warrior keeps assassinating diplomats on both sides. That same Eldar seems to be activating a defensive network of unknown power that will further interfere with negotiations and likely cause further loss of life. It is her job to lead a stealth team into the heart of the conflict, capture the Eldari, and force him to stop interfering. The Imperium of Man does not seem interested in this outcome. Shasri. The hunt does not wait for the warrior to sharpen his weapons. One rota, this earth cast tech will work. It's working now. Be over. Oh, we both know you'd never complete a successful hunt without me. <laughs> so we let you believe. But the fairy entry imminent.
focus now. We will deploy to the site at the last energy pulse. We will apprehend the Aldari survivor. Once captured, we will persuade it of the rightness of our intent, and the Guela will be forced to accept we fight a needless war. All will be brought to the greater good. For the greater good. To me. to the fate that awaits them. Enemy sensor, range approaching. Activate stealth fields. Their eyes shall be opened. All hint of illusion removed. Jostrey Lacoma's team are outfitted with XV-15 stealth suits while she is outfitted with an XV-25. Stealth suit teams often operate independently from the main force, being the special forces wing of the fire cast. These models are the smallest Tau battle suits and are barely larger than the standard issue armor given to line fire warriors. That being said, both the XV-15 and XV-25 have impressive cloaking technology, allowing them to sneak behind enemy lines and conduct sabotage and assassination missions, rarely being seen before they engage. The older XV-15 battlesuit system was captured by the Imperial Man, and fearing that it might be reverse engineered, the Tau have ramped up production of the XV-25, which is phasing out the older model. The battlesuit nomenclature system of the Tau is by size, with larger numbers indicating larger suits and hyphenated numbers indicating an experimental status. While mass deployment of battlesuits does take up a significant amount of resources, the Tau relish their use, as they maximize speed and lethality and minimize casualties, meaning that they can redeploy quickly to take advantage of gaps in enemy lines or withdraw from the battlefield if the higher goals of the battle cannot be achieved. As I mentioned in the introduction, Games Workshop has politely, if forcefully, requested that we do not use the entirety of an episode in our reviews and breakdowns. I view it as my job to cut out 30-40% to 40 of the content, so you have an incentive to go check out the original, but to leave the original meat and bones of the episode, particularly the gritty and satisfying violence, while filling in the gaps with informative and compelling lore. I genuinely do love creating this content, and it forces me to expand my knowledge of the universe and not just to rely on my passion. So if you like my breakdowns, like, share, and subscribe. Ring the bell so you see whenever new content drops. Comment down below and feel free to fight it out in the comment section over lore and narrative interpretations. If you can't think of anything else to say, then type in comment for the comment gods. I will salute you in real life with an Aquila, but I will reply with an 07 in the comment section saluting you for your service. Become a YouTube or Patreon member to help support the channel or check out our sponsors. I appreciate you. I'll catch you in the next one. Until the end. Special thanks to Vincent Louie, Dr. Pink Pill, John C., Christoph, Blue, Ramiro Gallegos, Nick Chitanava, Matthew Jones Carter, Kevin Rapp, Weed J666, Abigail Shane, Leo, That Rye Guy, Deidre Barlow, Lesser, Garbage, Christian Stafford, Fearmonger, Ellis Hayward, Driz, Ah Medicine, Miles, Keo Deos Betas, Thomas Jones, Thomas Concepts, Column, Pull Up a Couch, Orca, Chris Alberti, Joseph Moran, Yahweh, Ethrel, Chad Griffin, Chris Williams, Pig Joel, Runon, Trubledor, Happenstansky, CCS Supporter 96, Clinton Miller, Satya Avatara, Omni, Christian Valeris, Moon, Timothy Danford, Gassim, Tom Kai, Captain Entertainment, Ruben, and Sean Robertson.